Welcome, everybody, to the first geriatric grand rounds of 2023. I um, hope everyone is having a good day and a good start to the year. So we are starting the year with a real bang. So we are really lucky to have um, Jen Lai presenting. And I think Jen is known to many of you. Some of you trained with her. And you know, Jen has been a big part of our the geriatrics program for a number of years. So um, Jen is in the Division of Gastroenterology. She is a transplant hepatologist. And you know, Jen has just done incredible work um, at the at the intersection between geriatrics and hepatology, and you know, I, I I kind of view you, Jen, as kind of the prototypical model of like somebody who has really brought together geriatrics with another discipline, where people like before you started never really thought of geriatrics before. So geriatrics has really put the idea of frailty. Jen has really put the idea of frailty and geriatrics and um, geriatric assessment on the map, and you know thought really rigorously about how. Um, geriatric measures inform decision making in liver transplant and has really changed the nature of research in the field, has changed the way um, surgeons and transplant surgeons think about the process and just has had incredible impact. So just honor and a privilege to have you today and to, for all of us to learn more about your work. Thank you so much, Ken. It is such the, the honor and privilege is really absolutely all mine. Um, I feel like I've really, I, I feel like I've really made it when my work is actually recognized by the geriatrics community because oftentimes frailty is not considered very novel in geriatrics. So it's pretty fun to to be able to show you what we've been able to do in the in the frailty in in the hepatology world. So thanks again for the um, absolute privilege to be here. Nice to see everybody um, uh, on the participant screen. Uh, here are my disclosures. Let's see if I can, there we go. So I want to frame our conversation today about the transplant dilemma around one of the very first patients that I cared for as a liver fellow. I'll call him Mr. Davis. Um, he was a 65-year-old man with Nash cirrhosis, um, so that's non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or steatohepatitis, who presented to our transplant clinic with a MELD score of 15 and well-controlled ascites. So here he is on the MELD score map. Classic teaching that everybody learns, liver fellows, but even you know medical students, residents, is that a patient with a MELD score of 15 with portal hypertensive complications meets standard criteria for listing for transplant. So that's what we did. We went ahead and listed him. And every three months, he kept coming back for his follow-up visits. Every time with just a little bit more ascites, a little bit more encephalopathy, the, the wear and tear of cirrhosis, as well as his 65-year-old body, his medical comorbidities of prior hypertension and diabetes kind of wearing on his body, but his MELD score continued to remain in this very low and stable range between about 14 and 20, far below the MELD threshold of around 30 to 35, which is where a patient can actually draw a liver offer and get a liver transplant in our area. And every time they came into clinic, he and his caregiver would keep asking, when am I gonna get a transplant doc? I, you know, I have cirrhosis, you listed me months ago. And all we could say to him was, good news, you are too well for transplant because your MELD score is still 15. But when your MELD score gets to that 30, 35 threshold above which people get transplants, that's going to be your time. And sure enough, about a year and a half after he was listed for transplant, he finds himself in the 13 Moffat ICU with a MELD score of 40 after an acute variceal bleed. Now, as a liver fellow, at the time, I was so excited to present my patient I have been following forever to Dr. Asher, who is the master surgeon on service, because 
This was the moment that Dr. that Mr. Davis had been preparing for. We had completed all of his workup for transplant. We knew his heart was okay, his lungs were okay. He had no evidence of cancer. We had medically stabilized him after his acute variceal bleed. And now he was at the top of our wait list with a MELD score of 40. So what more was there to consider for him to proceed with transplant? And of course, Dr. Asher, with her decades of experience as a master surgeon, um, transplanting patient sees an entirely different Mr. Davis. She sees a, an individual who previously was obese, but now has incredible sarcopenic obesity and temporal wasting. He has interosseous muscle loss. He had little spontaneous movement in bed. He was so weak. He was propped up by the bed. Um, he, he was propped up by pillows, couldn't even maintain his, his um, vertical, vertical positioning. He was covered with blankets because he was so cold. He had a feeding tube because, because he couldn't nourish himself. And of all the things that she could have looked for on physical exam that I had been taught years ago as a medical student to look for in a patient with cirrhosis, checking for a fluid wave, uh, checking for pitting edema or asterixis, she only wanted to know one thing and asked him, sir, can you raise your arms above your head? And I hope you can imagine this patient in the 13 Moffat ICU, recovering from variceal bleed, 65, advanced age, years of cirrhosis and progressive portal hyper com hypertensive complications, co basically couldn't spontaneously generate the movement to raise his arms. So instead had to sort of lean over on the bed to try to generate some momentum to, to hoist his arm up, up, up to the level of his shoulder and then it dropped. So in other words, he couldn't raise his arms above his head. And at that very moment, every single one of us in the room knew that this patient was not going to be able to survive a transplant surgery because he was frankly too weak for surgery. And of course, I had to be the one to sit down with the family to inform them that we were not going to be able to offer him liver transplant at this time because he wouldn't be able to survive the transplant surgery even under the hands of the master surgeon, Dr. Asher. And you know what his brother said to me? He said to me, doctor, I, I don't understand. I've been sitting in your clinic with my brother uh, for multiple visits over the last year and a half, and you have been telling me that he is too well for transplant. And now that he is here with a MELD score of 40, you are telling me he is too sick? This was my introduction to the transplant dilemma and I've been thinking about it ever since. In transplant practice, we have this very well-established metric, the MELD score, to define and to clearly communicate to our patients the transplant threshold. Patients are, quote unquote, too well for transplant when they are below this line, but then we tell them, okay, well, when you get above this MELD score of X, then that's your time for transplant. You are within, you are above the transplant threshold. We can go to surgery. But in the background, as we are managing our patients on the wait list, transplant clinicians are constantly thinking about another threshold, and that is the point of transplant futility. And we often don't talk about this with our patients because most of the time that line is well above the transplant threshold, such that there's actually a very large window for transplant in between the transplant threshold and the line of transplant futility, where the patient will have a high enough MELD score and still be a suitable transplant, a su suitable surgical candidate. But what happened with Mr. Davis? And what is happening with increasing frequency, giving, given the advancing age of our patients, the increasing, um, the rapidly rising prevalence of uh, fatty liver disease as the primary etiology of liver disease, that, that along with it comes hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, coronary artery disease, our patients have increasing medical comorbidities, is that the line of transplant futility begins to drop while the patient is waiting on the list and all of the effects of their cirrhosis and their comorbidities take a toll on the patient's underlying physiologic reserve to the point where the lines of transplant futility cross the transplant threshold. <laughs> 
and there becomes a point at which there is never a time in the future where the patient will be sick enough to get a liver offer by MELDSCORE, but well enough to get a transplant surgery by physiologic reserve. And when framed in this way, it became crystal clear to me where the unmet need was. It was not in defining the transplant threshold that we have down very clearly, but rather it was in defining the, the threshold of transplant futility. And the only thing that I knew when I began my quest to figure out how to better define transplant futility was that it was not defined by the MELD score. So as I look back on Mr. Davis, what exactly was it that Dr. Asher, the master surgeon, could see in him that made her know that he was not going to make it through surgery? Well, hopefully you can tell from this story that she saw that he was just too frail for transplant. Now, it's easy for Dr. Asher to do. She has decades of experience transplanting patients and seeing where they go wrong and understanding which patients to transplant and which not, which not to, but how would it be possible for the rest of us, and I as a liver fellow at that time, to have been able to make that same assessment without the benefit of decades of clinical experience? Well, I was so lucky that at this point in my training, training I met Dr. Ken Kavinsky, the master geriatrician. And although, Ken, you practice an entirely different discipline of medicine, believe it or not, you share so much in common stylistically with Dr. Asher in your practice of medicine, given your very deep understanding and shared with Dr. Asher of the importance of frailty and patient outcomes. And it was Ken who taught me that actually frailty is more than the eyeball test. Frailty in the field of geriatrics is a formally defined construct. You guys in the audience all know this one, a distinct biologic syndrome of decreasing physiologic reserve and increasing vulnerability to health stressors. It was Ken who introduced me to a host of tools to operationalize frailty as a, as a whole construct, as well as components of frailty, such as disability, lower extremity function, uh, malnutrition, all of these components that go into the frail phenotype. And it was also Ken who reminded me and cautioned me actually not to get bogged down in definitions of frailty or in which instrument is best to measure frailty, but to remember what I was here to do research for, and that was to advance the integration of frailty and transplant. And so with Ken's mentorship and support, we formed the Frailty Study, which stands for Functional Assessment in Liver Transplantation. And I'm going to pause here to just acknowledge the incredible support of so many individuals and so many institutions who helped to fund this study, including a full team of study coordinators and biostatisticians and trainees, as well as my incredible mentorship team, including Ken, Sandy Fang, a transplant surgeon, or Taroa hepatologist, and Dori Segev, a, frail, a, a frailty expert in kidney transplant, um, and then all of these um, institutional bodies who helped to fund the frailty study. One of the first things that we did was try to establish a tool. We developed the Liver Frailty Index, a cirrhosis-specific frailty tool that consists of three performance-based tests, grip strength, chair stands, and balance, so very similar to the short physical performance battery that takes less than 90 seconds to complete in the outpatient clinic setting. It is a fully continuous metric and is scaled like the MELD score. So the higher the, the liver frailty index, the, the greater degree of frailty, but also the sicker the patient is, just like the MELD score, so that hepatologists could and transplant clinicians could really easily wrap their mind around this index that sort of that is a worse score equals a sicker patient. We also categorized patients using the liver frailty index as frail and robust so that we could then uh, put out a lot of literature to help the community better understand the impact of frailty on outcomes in patients with cirrhosis. Here's one of our seminal studies that we put out in um, 
2018, where we demonstrated how the liver frailty index or frailty as measured by the liver frailty index helped to better stratify patients with decompensated cirrhosis um, better than MELD score alone with respect to waitlist mortality. So here's a patient, this is an average waitlist candidate um, uh, at UCSF or really in the nation with a MELD score of 14. And typically we used to think of them as having one single line of um, predicted probability of survival that would just go down somewhere in between here. And you can see clearly that robust patients have better survival than those who are frail. And the same thing held true, even if they had higher MELD scores, a patient with a MELD of 23 is a much more dynamic patient, um, probably is going to decompensate and need a transplant in the next three months. And again, regardless of whether their MELD score is higher, frailty continues to predict mortality above and beyond the MELD score. What was even more telling was when we overlay these curves, and you can see here that there's an overlap of these two curves in the middle. A patient with the higher MELD score who's robust has the same predicted probability of survival on the wait list as a patient with the lower MELD score who is frail. So in other words, being frail, at least as measured by the liver frailty index is equivalent to about nine MELD points of mortality risk. In the liver transplant field, this is a huge number. This is uh, the difference between a patient who might be on the wait list for the next year, somebody who actually might be working, to somebody I would actually tell in clinic they shouldn't be traveling because at any moment they could decompensate and they could need a transplant immediately. We also spent a lot of our early years with the liver frailty index trying to make this um, make this a tool that could be used in clinical practice to really take this tool out of the papers and out of the ivory tower into clinical practice. And one of the early things we did was to integrate this into EPIC. And so we actually have the liver frailty index, and this was actually inspired a lot by Melissa Wong's work that she's been doing in the cancer world, where we developed a frailty flow sheet that can be used in liver transplant, and the medical assist assistants will actually uh, test frailty using the liver frailty index at the um, at the time of, of checking the vital signs and then input the liver frailty index into the vital signs or into this frailty flow sheet. And then the liver frailty index scores can be pulled into the, um, into the clinic note using a smart phrase, and one can see the trajectories of frailty. This patient here actually improved their frailty score. The next thing we did was we started to expand uh, the, our frailty study beyond UCSF, recognizing the importance of establishing the generalizability of the frailty construct outside of the UCSF sphere. One of the early criticisms we received was that our results or our findings were really not generalizable because UCSF is kind of this magical transplant place. We have the benefit of these master um, clinicians such as Dr. Asher herself or Dr. Roberts people who have been transplanting for decades. So does the frailty construct actually um, apply and is generalizable outside of UCSF? And so we, we proved it by bringing frailty into all of these other centers as part of our frailty study. And with this expanded cohort, over the last five to seven years, we've been able to demonstrate many different things, including how frailty predicts mortality above and beyond traditional risk factors for mortality. So the first traditional risk factor for mortality in patients with cirrhosis is the degree of portal hypertension. So it, classic teaching is that a patient who has ascites has a much higher risk of mortality than someone who doesn't have ascites. Um, a patient who has encephalopathy has a much higher risk of death than somebody who doesn't have encephalopathy. And so uh, one of the early criticisms about frailty was, well, does it really predict above and beyond ascites and encephalopathy, or is frailty just sort of interchangeable? with ascites and encephalopathy? Well, we proved that wrong. And we did a study in which we looked at the risk of mortality in patients with and without specific portal hypertensive complications. 
Here you can see the risk of weightless mortality in patients with decompensated cirrhosis, but who did not have ascites or encephalopathy. These patients were listed for other reasons, such as H, uh, liver cancer or, uh, or varices. And you can see here that patients who are frail had almost double the risk of weightless mortality as patients who were not frail. And then when we looked at patients who had ascites here on the right and did not have ascites here on the left, you can see again over double the risk of weightless mortality in, in patients with decompensated cirrhosis who were frail versus those who were not, regardless of whether they had ascites or not. Same exact pattern in patients with hepatic encephalopathy. Whether or not the patient had his encephalopathy, frailty continued to be strongly predictive of weightless mortality. Um, and in patients who had both ascites and hepatic encephalopathy, exact same pattern. Patients who are frail die more than those who aren't. The second predictor that is very commonly associated with mortality in patients with cirrhosis, and truthfully all patients, is age. And one of the questions we wanted to answer is, well, does, is frailty just collinear with age, or um, does frailty allow us to identify older adults or younger adults who are actually um, more vulnerable to death? So we looked at the cumulative incidence of mortality, that's what this figure shows, in um, a multi-center cohort of patients, and we stratified them by older, de older defined as greater than or equal to 65 years, as well as by their frailty status defined by the liver frailty index cutoffs that we had established. And here we're just looking at patients who are not frail. And as predicted, remember I told you we know that in patients with cirrhosis awaiting transplants, age do, older age does predict mortality to a certain extent. So here you can see that the older patients are at higher risk of death. But let's bring in the frail patients as well. And you can see that same pattern we saw with the initial meld and frail, meld frailty strata, where the younger patient, so the younger patient is supposed to have a, a, a higher survival or a lower risk of death than the older patient here um, on this third line. But you can see that actually the younger frail patient is sort of looking like the older not frail patient. And the person who has the highest risk of death is the one who's both older and frail. So again, frailty is helping us um, further risk stratify patients who are most vulnerable to death, independent of these traditional risk factors for death, in this case, age. And then I'm just going to show you one more, which is body mass index, which is increasingly important in liver transplant because we are are seeing more obese patients and it is getting harder for us to identify obese patients who um, should go to transplant or not, understanding that in some studies obesity is associated with increased uh, complications and increased mortality. And we're seeing the exact same figure. I won't go into this in great detail, except just to point out that regardless of BMI strata, so whether they have normal BMI, obese BMI, morbidly obese BMI, it's all the frail patients who end up having the higher uh, cumulative incidence of mortality as compared to those who are not frail on using the liver frailty index. Using our expanded multicenter cohort of over a thousand patients, we've also been able to play around with trajectories of frailty while on the wait list and have been able to demonstrate that um, not only is the liver frailty index responsive to change, but actually a change in frailty is predictive of mortality. And so here is the cumulative incidence of mortality by trajectories of frailty. People who were stable in this third line, people who are worsening either moderate or severe worsening in the top two lines. As you can see, if they had worsening of frailty, they had much higher risk of mortality than those who were stable. But I wanna um, call your attention to those to the bottom line, which is those people who improved their frailty on the wait list. Now this could have been spontaneous improvement or it could have been by some sort of efforts on, uh, on, on the part of the patient to prehabilitate. But regardless of how they improved, those who had improvement in their frailty had um, significantly lower risk of weightless mortality than those who didn't um, improve their frailty or had severe worsening of their frailty. And in multivariate modeling, this was 
independent of changes in MELD score, changes in ascites, and changes of hepatic encephalopathy. But if you look at this number, this less than 1% risk of death at six months for a patient on the liver transplant wait list, that's nearly unheard of. So this improvement in frailty really gives us, these, these observational data, I should say, really gives us a clue as to what we might be able to do in the future if we start to prehabilitate our patients, maybe if we make them less frail with interventions, perhaps we can actually reduce their waitlist mortality. Now, thus far, I've been focusing our, um, the data that I've been showing you on the outcome of waitlist mortality, but I do want to emphasize that frailty, we've also been able to demonstrate that frailty is associated with post-transplant survival. So here's a study from our multi-center cohort, nearly 1,200 liver transplant recipients at our eight centers who underwent ambulatory assessments of frailty using the liver frailty index. And we demonstrated that those who are frail had lower survival after transplant compared to those who were not frail, and this was a significant result. And in multivariate modeling, it, frailty actually uh, was associated with a two times increased risk of mortality compared to those who were not frail. And frailty, importantly, was also strongly associated with healthcare utilization. Um, and so frailty, we showed, was associated with a much higher rate of a very long hospital stay after transplant, higher inpatient, uh, sorry, higher ICU days after transplant, higher number of um, inpatient hospitalized days within 90 days of transplant, which is really important because a lot of insurance companies actually bundle our payments within the first 90 days of transplant. So any day in the hospital within the first 90 days after transplant is not covered separately. Um, and then a higher rate of non-home discharge, so a higher rate of discharge to a skilled nursing facility or a rehab facility rather than to home. So let's return back to the original dilemma. Could frailty help us to define this threshold of transplant futility that I so badly wanted to figure out after caring for Mr. Davis? Well, it's not going to be as simple as just replacing the liver frailty index with the transplant futility. I think we all know this from caring for, trans, uh, caring for patients. It doesn't come down to a single factor. But as I was thinking about how to help the community integrate frailty into transplant decision making, I have presented to the community uh, this framework. Now, I, in this framework, I want you to think of three different patients, a patient A, a patient B, and a patient C, all of whom have the same amount as represented by the area of uh, the area within the square of vulnerability to poor outcomes pre-transplant. But the thing that differentiates these three patients is actually the amount of vulnerability that is related to the gray box. The gray box is what I will call transplant non-responsive factors. So that is vulnerability that is not going to improve with transplant. That is vulnerability such as the effects of advancing age, um, hypertension, diabetes, whereas what's in the white box is stuff that will get better with a new liver or transplant responsive stuff like liver failure, ascites, encephalopathy. So all of these patients go to transplant. They're left with what is, we, we get rid of everything that's in the white box. They're left with what is left in the gray box. And you can see how transplant A has a favorable overall outcome after transplant and patient C has a poor overall outcome. And so really the key to unlocking this framework for transplant decision-making is trying to identify and come up with really what is in this gray box. So here is really where we have to turn to the art of medicine, where we start to synthesize all of the information about the patient that we're doing during this transplant evaluation to come up with the clinician's global assessment of their vulnerability. But we don't just come up with it in the air we actually use a lot of data. There are the transplant responsive components like synthetic dysfunction, portal hypertension, and renal function. And then there are the transplant non-responsive factors that we use as transplant clinicians, such as cardiac function, comorbidities, muscle wasting, undernutrition, and physical inactivity. activity. 
And for all of these components, we have learned as transplant clinicians to, to rely on objective data. For the transplant responsive factors, I've told you, we have MELT score. We use child Pew score all the time. We use creatinine and urinalysis to assess kidney function. And for these other extra hepatic factors, we have vital signs and their blood pressure, their heart rate. We use an echocardiogram. We get hemoglobin A1C to, to assess their diabetes control. We do colon cancer screening. We get mammograms, we get PFTs. And yet up until recently, for this factor that we all know, especially you in the, in the geriatrics community, know really predicts outcomes. We were only using the eyeball test. And for Dr. Asher, for that single patient, Mr. Davis, she was using the raise the arm above the head test. And so now that we have a tool, the liver frailty index that has been developed for patients with cirrhosis, validated in a multi-center cohort, can we start to integrate objective assessments of frailty to help us uh, more accurately assess and integrate this critical transplant non-responsive component into our clinician's global assessment? So if we can take this back to our framework for transplant decision-making, we can use this global assessment and say, oh my goodness, of, of all the things that is making this patient vulnerable, I'm very worried that his or her vulnerability is dominated by their frailty, by their malnutrition, by their physical inactivity, by the, by the long-standing effects of all of their non-hepatic medical comorbidities. And that's what's making this patient frail. And this patient will not will we'll have poor outcomes after transplant. And perhaps this is how we can get to a place where we can more clearly define the line of transplant futility and communicate that line to our patients. Now within this framework, I want to call your attention to one other aspect and that is the outcome. And thus far, I have really presented to you um, only data that has emphasized the outcome of survival. These data have been absolutely critical to convince the transplant community and transplant surgeons that actually frailty is an important metric. But if we move for, as we look forward to where frailty should go in the transplant world and how frailty can help us, um, I want to get to the place where we begin to define transplant futility not as a low probability of surviving, but actually as a low probability of thriving. And here's where I want to present to you some other data that we've been putting out simultaneously in the community. This, we have demonstrated um, that frailty is associated with significant disability. This was a really fun study I got to do with Ken and John Singer, who's an expert in frailty and lung transplant. And we demonstrated that when we, that, that patients who were frail or as patients had greater degrees of frailty by the liver frailty index. So here are patients who are robust on the left and then patients who are uh, frail in the dark black bar, the tallest dark black bar, you can see that these patients were reporting significantly higher rates of disability by the ADL, ADL scale um, for a lot of the major um, disabilities major um, life activities, bathing, dressing, transferring from the bed to the chair, as well as um, maintaining continence. We've also demonstrated that frailty is strongly associated with patient reported symptom burden using the, the Edmonton Symptom Assessment Scale. So again, frailty is in the dark black bar, and you can see that as frailty increases, rates of self-reported pain, fatigue, nausea, drowsiness, appetite, poor appetite, well-being, and overall psychological distress increase dramatically.
We've also been able to follow the trajectories of frailty after transplant with this idea that perhaps some of the frailty that we see in patients pre-transplant is actually liver frailty. Maybe some of that would reverse. So I want to show you just some, some trajectories of frailty that we, um, that we observed. I, I wouldn't say trajectories. This was not a trajectory analysis. We just looked at a cross-sectional uh, snapshot of frailty at different time points post-transplant. Pre-transplant in the ambulatory setting, our patients had a median liver frailty index of 3.7, with our cutoff of frail being above 4.5 and being robust at 3.2. After transplant, three months post-transplant, now these patients usually go home at an average of seven days, and but three months after transplant, after they've been home for two to three months, their liver frailty index actually goes up. And that means they become more frail even after three months of recovery. And it wasn't only until six months after their liver transplant that they, they came back to the level they were pre-transplant. But remember, at pre-transplant, they had jaundice, coagulopathy, portal hypertension, ascites, hepatic encephalopathy. And it's only at six months when their liver is functioning perfectly, they have no portal hypertensive complications, and they're still physiologically and physically in that same place as they were pre-transplant. And it's only at 12 months post-transplant do we start seeing the liver frailty index improve to a place where it is significantly below where they were better than where they were pre-transplant. Now, just to give you a point of reference, only two out of five met criteria for quote unquote robust a year after transplant. But this criteria for robust is hardly a high bar. If I were to test the liver frailty index on each of you in the audience right now, you'd be right around here. You'd be in the 2.8 range, community dwelling adult with no liver disease. And I have actually done this study um, with one of our fellows, Connie Wong, um, where we did go in grand rounds and we tested community dwelling adults um, and, that the, and the average liver frailty index among a very wide um, age range is around 2.8 or 2.9. And so even a year out after liver transplant, we're not really getting patients to, it, to the place where they are um, physically functional uh, community dwelling adults, which honestly was quite a surprise to me. And lastly, um, we have demonstrated that pre-transplant frailty is associated with poor poorer post-transplant quality of life. Here you can see self-reported quality of life scores by the SF36 in patients who are frail with the black bar and patients who are not frail in the dotted light, lighter gray bar. And you can see that there were significantly lower uh, self-reported quality of life in the frail patients for all of the physical domains. So not the emotional or the role emotional domains, but actually all of the physical domains, which really makes a lot of sense given that the, the liver frailty index is a very physical metric of grip strength, chair stands, and balance. And so this, in my opinion, is the power of frailty is that it allows, it, it can be used not just as a predictor of outcomes, but it can actually be used as an outcome itself because it's so strongly associated with disability and self-reported quality of life. Frailty allows us to focus on quality of life, not just quantity of life. Frailty allows clinicians to convey information to patients more intuitively. We can talk to them about outcomes in terms of, of whether they're going to be weak or whether they're going to achieve mobility or functional independence after transplant. Frailty also gives patients the, the door and the language to express their goals and wishes. When we only talk about survival, it's really hard to have a conversation there because patients aren't going to say, well, I want to die, you know, but they do, they can actually express that they want to live a certain way. They want to achieve a certain quality of life. And that way we can try 
to facilitate decisions that are concordant with patients' values. If all they want to do is live another day than they would have with cirrhosis, okay, well, that, that we can do with liver transplant. But if what they really want to do is achieve a certain physical and, and physical functioning and quality of life, we can now set some expectations for them about um, whether they can expect that after transplant and how soon after transplant. And so we can use frailty to facilitate these conversations about their expectations. So for example, a patient might ask, what will the post-operative recovery period look like? And we can say, well, it may take six to 12 months to become functionally independent. That's what our data showed. They might ask, they might say, I can't wait to start working in construction again. This was a real comment from one of my patients. And I had to tell him, well, you will get stronger, definitely, but you may not be able to be working on the bridge doing construction like you were before. And then other patients will tell me, I don't want to be dependent upon my family for long-term care. And we can have discussions around what their post-transplant recovery period might look like and how long it might take them um, for them to get dependent so that they aren't um, so that they can be independent after a period of time, depending upon their pre-transplant frailty. And so I want to return back to the original patient I met when I was a liver fellow and return back to the transplant dilemma and see if we could have done this differently. So there was Mr. Davis showing up to us in clinic with a MELD score of 15 and well-controlled ascites and listed for transplant. And we could tell him about the transplant threshold and say, your MELD score is too low right now, um, but when your MELD score is 30 or 35, you'll get a transplant. But we can add to the conversation and start to prepare the family to say, well, I also want to let you know that there is a place where you could be too sick for transplant. There is this line of transplant futility, and this is how we define it. And then as Mr. Davis is on the transplant list, visiting us in clinic with a stable MELD score, but have feeling the effects on his physiologic reserve of the cirrhosis, the portal hypertension, and his medical comorbidities, we can tell him, well, you're too well by MELD score, but Mr. Davis, I am worried that your line of transplant futility is dropping. And if we see that place where the lines cross such that it is not possible for him to be sick enough by MELD score, but well enough for transplant surgery, we can, we can tell him that at a time when he's actually sitting in clinic and can make some decisions. Now, at this point, you may wonder, well, what decisions are there to make? Is this the end? You're just gonna tell him he's too sick and send him on his way? And that this is the exciting part of where we are in frailty research and liver transplant, because I don't think this line of transplant futility is fixed. I think that we are going to get to this place in the next hopefully three to five years where we are developing multidisciplinary prehabilitation programs where we can actually raise this line of transplant futility in, in patients who are very vulnerable. I mean, ideally all patients, but given our resource limitations in the most vulnerable patients, um, such that we can try to, try to get this line up and we can find a place where there is a threshold or an area in which the patient will be able to achieve transplant. Perhaps we can use these data and what we know about transplant futility to, to actually bring the line of, trans, of the transplant threshold down. There actually are ways to do this. We can encourage our patients to accept higher risk donor livers, patient, livers from patients with uh, hepatitis C, or patients, um, we can actually uh, put livers on pump and actually transport them from farther away than we have previously considered. Um, we can encourage patients to seek living donor liver transplantation. Oftentimes, patients don't want to ask their family or friends for a, to be a living donor, but when they know that they have reached that place where they can't get a deceased donor offer because they, they can't afford to be so sick by MELD score, that is oftentimes the push that they need to accept a living donor 
or given our much longer wait time in the Bay Area versus other places in the nation, this sometimes is a push to encourage patients to seek a transplant at another center with a lower MELD score. And then lastly, if these options are not available to either raise the line of transplant futility or lower the transplant threshold, there are also many other things that we can do to support our patients. We can integrate early palliative care to help reduce suffering and facilitate values concordant care. And this may be that place where we can start to do co-management with palliative care and transplant clinicians together. These might be the individuals who are the perfect place to start with. And so these are my final thoughts on the transplant dilemma. We are increasingly being faced with the transplant dilemma with patients that are getting older, with more comorbidities, and are getting sicker. Objective assessment of factors that we consider as futile can facilitate the conversations with our patients to provide values concordant care. Thank you very much. Dr. Lai, thank you so much for your interesting, fascinating work. There are some, this is me to you, Carl, one of the coordinator for the geriatric grand rounds. I hope you have some time to answer some questions from the audience. I would love to. Okay. Um, so Alex, Dr. Smith said, um, Um, this is a Dr. Smith Church is a terrific work. Couple questions. How is the uptake of frailty measures in clinical practice within other transplants? Various to incorporating it. Another related issue is what has the uptake been of other geriatric concepts in the transplant? So the uptake of frailty measures in clinical practice have they were slow at first when we didn't have sufficient data linking frailty with mortality. But when we started to go out there, when the frailty researchers started to go out there and tell surgeons, hey, this patient is more likely to die after transplant and die soon after transplant or um, have a longer length of stay, they started to listen. Because in reality, surgeons don't want bad outcomes and they don't want higher healthcare utilization. And so it was very important for us that our first pieces were always associated with those critical outcomes that could convince transplant centers, transplant administrators, and transplant surgeons to accept this metric. One of the biggest barriers to um, I would say one of the biggest barriers to early work around frailty before the liver frailty index was that a lot of the indices that were out there involved patient reported or self reported um, measures. So, you know, free frailty index has those self reported components, or the Karnofsky performance scale just feels so subjective. And so, patients or so providers felt like it was too subjective to use in transplant. And that's why we, we created the performance-based liver frailty index because it's a much more objective metric. Um, however, one of the barriers to implementation there has just been that people perceive it to take a long time and you need to buy the hand dynamometer. But when we again started to put out there that, hey, it takes 90 seconds to complete in the outpatient practice. You do it with the vital signs, and it is a hell of a lot more valuable than heart rate and blood pressure and O2 set and temperature in the outpatient clinic. They they really started to buy to, to buy into this. Um, let's see. So 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 far, actually, uh, it has actually been um, the uptake has been pretty good, and it's taken about five years for us to get there. That's pretty good, five years, and we have a lot of nationwide uptake. That's tremendous. Um, another question um, is that because you were able to create a compelling framework for integrating frailty and liver transplant, do you have thoughts about how other subspecialties, such as orthopedic for spine surgery, cardiology, PCI, et cetera, might use your research framework to integrate frailty into their respective interventions of frailty? 
Yeah, well, you know, I will be the first to admit that that framework of the, the res, you know, treatment responsive, treatment non-responsive is actually not original. It it's actually comes from heart failure first. And so it comes from um, decision making, at least what I know of where it comes from is decision making around whether to put in an LVAD in patients with heart failure. But I have seen similar models in oncology, whether to pursue chemotherapy or um, curative sur or, or, or surgery, palliative surgeries. Um, this framework, the idea of uh, treatment responsive versus treatment non-responsive factors applies, I think, very broadly to um, other specialties and um, other clinical decision-making. But we agree with you, they have to apply both frailty and other factors into any kind of intervention. I hope we have time for one more. How much of the increase in transplant fertility occurs acutely in the hospital associated with an acute event and potentially less amenable to intervention? Oh, that is such an interesting question. The short answer is, I don't know, but it's something that our team is incredibly interested in. Um, you have picked up on this fact that right now, all of our research has focused entirely on patients in the outpatient setting or the assessment of frailty in the outpatient setting. We made this choice um, as our initial step in studying frailty because I believed that if we measured in the outpatient setting, that's kind of the chronic frailty. So that's the underlying frailty. But you're absolutely right. When they're in the hospital and then they have their acute variceal bleed or their SBP, they will get a physical manifestation of frailty that actually might reverse very easily once you give them antibiotics or you give them a transplant. And that is the foundation for my next R01 um, and the next five years of my research. We're actually going to be in the hospital measuring frailty on the inpatient setting. And so I'll hopefully in the next five years, I'll come back and give you a talk and answer that question. What do I believe and what do I what do I believe is going to happen? I believe very much in kind of the, the undercurrent of your question. I think that that inpatient frailty is not going to be associated with mortality. I think that inpatient frailty will just not be as predictive as outpatient frailty because, um, or, or I should say of post-transplant mortality, because that frailty that we see in the hospital is probably due to factors that are very reversible as the patient is acutely decompensating, as opposed to the frailty that we see in the outpatient setting that is kind of due to more to their advancing age and their sarcopenia and their longstanding diabetes. But that's more to, more to come. Fantastic, something to look forward to in five more years. We have to have you come back and present your work. I would love to. <laughs> that would be great. Uh, I think that is all the questions I have uh, from the audience. But again, thank you so much on behalf of all of us who benefited so much from your uh, work and fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be with you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.